Welcome to a conversation on the future of land and property rights for global development. As many of you know, this issue is increasingly in the media and on the minds of development professionals. Recognizing this growing interest, DevEx has partnered with USAID, Comonix, TetraTech, Thomson Reuters uh, to create a month-long campaign called Land Matters. Land Matters is generating interest and building knowledge about the central role that land and property rights play in development, helping to connect the dots between land and important development outcomes with articles on Land Matters for Women, Land Matters for Environmental Protection, and Land Matters for Economic Development, among others. I'd encourage you to visit landmatters.devx.com to read more about the land sector and the challenges and opportunities that we all have to promote secure land rights for women and men around the world. And although the Land Matters campaign is drawing to a close, DevX will continue to address these critical issues in its daily news coverage. So now, um, I'd like to introduce our panelists, and we have a veritable brain trust of land tenure expertise with us today. Uh, beginning on my left is Dr. Gregory Myers, who is the Chief of the Land Tenure and Property Rights Division at USAID. Dr. Myers uh, is also Acting Director of the Office of Land Tenure and Resource Management. He served as the Chair of the UN FAO's Committee for World Food Security Working Group for the Voluntary Guidelines for Responsible Governance of Tenure of Land, Fisheries, <laughs> and forests, and I'm not done, in the context of national food security, which from he henceforth we shall refer to as the VGs. <laughs> yeah. At USA, Dr. Myers manages a $700 million program supporting good land governance. Much of his work focuses on conflict-prone countries, although the division is global and addresses key development issues including food security, global climate change, women's property rights, conflict mitigation, economic growth, and natural resource management. Your team connects all those dots. He currently serves as the U.S. Senior Technical Advisor to the White House on land governance issues, including for the formulation of U.S. positions in the G8 to implement the voluntary guidelines support responsible agricultural investment and improve transparency in land transactions. And on top of all this, he's a senior technical advisor for the U.S. in formulating the U.N. Committee for Food Security's Principles for Responsible Agricultural Investment. His Ph.D. is in Development Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and we'll see a theme as we go through the rest of our introductions. <laughs> Okay, next to Gregory is Mr. Tiernan Menon. Tiernan is director at Comonix International. He's an attorney and land rights, rule of law, human rights, and democracy and governance expert with 14 years of professional experience in over 20 countries on all continents. I had a note to myself to ask you about Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> He's director for the Columbia Human Rights Project and land tenure and resource practice area at Comonix International. Prior to joining Comonix, he directed a global legal empowerment program at the Open Society Foundation, conducted customary land tenure analysis in Africa, advised on anti-corruption work at the World Bank, led a justice sector strengthening project in Bolivia, and directed access to justice initiatives in South Sudan. Tiernan's JD is from the Cornell Law School, and he has an MA in International Development in Economics from the School for Advanced International Studies, SAIS at Johns Hopkins. He also served in the Peace Corps in Honduras and is fluent in Spanish. And then that leaves, uh, finally, our final panelist, Dr. Steve Lowry, who is on Tiernan's left. Steve, over his 30-year career, has alternated between academic and research positions and the leadership of development assistance programs in both Africa and Asia. He's lived and worked overseas for a total of about 16 years on a variety of assignments in Africa and Asia. Most recently, he led the USAID-funded Sudan Property Rights Program in Juba, South Sudan. This project helped the new nation develop a national land policy, which I believe was, was recently adopted yes, in uh, 2000. Yes, in February, yes. Yeah, in February of this year. Great, that was, that's a great policy, by the way. Steve was also trained at the Land Tenure Center at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His research demonstrates, this is an important point actually, how common property arrangements differed from open access situations and could provide a basis for pastoralists and forest dwellers 
to sustainably manage their own natural resources. In 1988, he became associate director for the Land Tenure Center in charge of Africa programs. In 1992, he joined the Ford Foundation as assistant rep for South Africa and Namibia. As head of the foundation's office in Windhoek, Steve directed several million dollars of funding to land reform initiatives in South Africa. They may need you back. <laughs> he served as head of the foundation's office for the Middle East in Cairo from 1997 to 2001 and as director of the foundation's office of management services from 2001 to 2005. Steve was also president of Antioch College from 2006 to 2007. So you can see it's a great panel that we have here today to talk about some really interesting issues at the top of many people's minds. I'm Carol Boudreau, and I'm very pleased to be moderating this discussion today. Um, I serve as Director of Investments in the Property Rights Portfolio for the Omidyar Network, uh, which has a Washington, D.C. office, but is headquartered in Redwood City, California. Before joining Omidyar, I worked at USAID with Gregory Myers in the Land Tenure Division, uh, and before that served as an instructor at the George Mason School of Law and also as lead researcher for a project entitled Enterprise Africa. So gentlemen, over the last several years, what have we seen? We've seen the AU developing the land policy initiative. We've seen the, implement the, the endorsement of the voluntary guidelines and now the process of implementing the voluntary guidelines. This year, 2013, the G8 included a land transparency initiative. Um, and this summer, we saw the high-level panel of eminent persons discussing the post-2015 MDGs and including two different targets related to property rights. So my opening question for you is, is this a historic moment in the land sector and why? Gregory, maybe we can start with you. Yes, I think it is an actually a, an historic moment. And I think all of those things that you mentioned, plus a few more, suggest that the global community has realized that focusing on property rights is really a, a way to focus on a gateway to achieving um, greater development objectives. So for example, now we see a very large interest in investing in both commercial and private agriculture around the world. And I think this is a very positive thing. I think it's a way to really promote agricultural development and to really dramatically change the lives of people that we're trying to help around the world. The trick, though, is, is the way in which we do it. Right? And so I think that's why there's this global conversation taking place right now about what's best practice, what's the best thing to do. Um, how do we get the most development we can for a small amount of dollars? Um, and, and we haven't seen anything like this in the past this kind of interest, this kind of investment that's taking place. So uh, yes, I think it's an historic moment, and I think it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to have a dramatic impact on um, reducing um, um, food insecurity and addressing uh, child uh, um, uh, nutrition needs um, and other um, strategic, economic, and political objectives. Steve, do you agree? Do you see this as a historic moment for the land sector? I think very much so, Carol. I, I very much agree with, with Gregory. I, I think there's a a, a growing recognition, and this is you know, Gregory's group at USAID, others, donors deserve some real credit for this, uh, the foundational importance of property rights, let me put it this way, of secure property rights to human progress. That, you know, for many decades we thought in development, for instance, uh, about livelihoods, we want to enhance people's livelihoods, income, focus on income, vitally important, but we've come to understand that assets are also important where people control assets, that's property, landed land, and other natural resources, they have a foundation on which to build sustainable livelihoods over time. Women have an ability where they have autonomous property rights to invest in food security for themselves and for their children. They have an ability to keep abusive relationships at bay. Uh, they're less vulnerable to HIV AIDS, research has suggested. And where communities have better control over the natural resources that they use collectively, we're able potentially to make better progress with some of the you know, problems we're struggling with globally around climate change. So, you know, we've come to see secure property rights, and I emphasize security of tenure, as foundational to human progress in a host of areas that really concern us, economic development, but also human rights. So Tiernan, you come at this issue from a very strong legal, legal empowerment, human rights perspective. Do you also see secure property rights as critical to achieving those sorts of goals? 
Um, I, th I think so, and, and I, th I see this as an opportunity to be a historic moment. Mm -hmm. um, I still think there's a lot of challenges. Um, I think there's certain connections which haven't quite been made yet. There's a strong you know, democracy, governance, rule of law, human rights community out there which doesn't connect to land rights. Mm -hmm. They don't understand land rights, they don't understand, they don't see it as part of the mandate of human rights. I think part of the work that, you know, that we've been doing collectively in the land rights community is, is linking up with those groups, and linking up with the importance of that. But I think there's a lot more we can do to, to show how land rights are important for human rights, important for democracy promotion, important for governance. But I also think there's a lot of, of potential challenges mm -hmm. um, in this and that there's a lot of interest, there's, there's a lot of movement on the land front in the private sector as well. There's a lot of issues potentially um, complicated issues around large-scale land acquisition, investment. So I think it's a potentially historic moment, but there's a lot of risks, a lot of challenges out there as well. Yeah, I agree with you. I think there are a lot of very important challenges in this sector. And so let me ask you a follow-up question. Um, can you be a little bit more specific and tell me, tell us what you see as some of the critical challenges in this sector? Is it connecting the dots between the human rights governance community and the tenure folks, or is it something else? What, what are you seeing in your, from your work? Um, I, I think ownership in general, land ownership and land control is still um, very much in doubt at a local level in so many countries. Um, actual implementation of, of the guidelines, of policies, of human rights framework is lacking. And, and I think some of this even requires going back and looking at historic ownership and control. I mean, there's been a number of of, you know, this is again from my legal standpoint, there's been a number of cases that have been analyzing um, whether or not ownership is really vested in the government or who actually owns land. There's a lot of insecurity about this. Is it government owned land? Is it, is it tribally owned land? And a lot of this indication or a lot of these determinations were done hundreds of years ago, 50 years ago, and there's a need to go back and, and analyze that still to determine who owns what. Mm -hmm. Steve, actually, earlier this year, you wrote what I thought was a really provocative article in The Guardian that is, can be found on the DevEx Land Matters site um, about the, the really strong need that exists today to recognize customary rights in the statutory framework. Um, I wonder if you could talk for a minute about that particular challenge in our sector. No, sure. That's, uh, thanks for, for mentioning that. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the article really taught, uh, sought to make the point that uh, you know, there are generally different ways of securing property rights. There's private tenure, there's public tenure, but there's also customary tenure. And about 90% of rural households in Africa hold land under customary tenure. And the basic principle of customary tenure is that people gain their land rights by virtue of their membership in the community. It's a social right. They don't go to the market to purchase land they are, in a sense, born into or inherit that right. And there's been a, a discourse that we've seen from mainly Western quarters over the decades that, well, that right is somehow inher in, 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 inherently insecure. And, and a lot of evidence now suggests that, in fact, tenure security is quite strong in the customary sector. So, so and I think there's increasing recognition, and this comes back to Tiernan's point, that underlying these customary practices is public or state ownership of those rights. And this gives the state, sometimes there'll be a corrupt politician or sometimes, you know, kind of pressure to make that land available to foreign investors. Uh, and so the, the kind of rights that those communities seem to enjoy can suddenly be extinguished rather arbitrarily because the underlying tenure is public land. So there's been this fabulous movement, I think it's a very important movement, uh, led by people in Africa, led by various thinkers uh, in the West, in the U.S., and USAID, uh, groups like Namati, wonderful NGO, that have, have been advocating for the statutory recognition of customary tenure. That, that let's, make in, let's make customary tenure in law of equal legal standing as freehold tenure and public land. And then, you know, people and communities and countries can make choices, you know, we can recognize and we can live with a plurality of, of tenure arrangements, but let's secure those customary rights. So that, for instance, if a big company wants to sort of secure land for 99 years to invest in agriculture, the folks that they would negotiate with would be 
those communities. And those communities, with some technical support, probably, can kind of come to those kind of agreements without feeling aggrieved and feeling that, in fact, they're benefiting from that. That's the first point I would make. And the second point I would make is that this article sought to make was that, you know, we talk a lot about social, economic, and political rights. And all but three countries in Africa uh, have adopted the covenant on, international covenant on social, economic, and cultural rights. Among those are rights to livelihood, rights to housing. There's not a right to land provided in that covenant. Okay? And, but importantly, the right to livelihood or the exercise of that right, the right to housing, is contingent upon land. And my argument was that, is that instead of sort of trying to create these sort of new rights to land and livelihoods and housing, let's recognize that under our feet is a system based on customary rights that provides access to land as a social right. And let's sort of embrace that as, as an achievement in something worthy of protection, principally through statutory recognition of those rights. Gregory, I'd like to give you a chance to respond um, and perhaps uh, you know, choose what you'd like to respond to Tiernan or to Steve and uh, from your perspective inside the U.S. government. First of all, the U.S. government invests less than 1% of the budget in foreign assistance. It's a very small amount of money. And of that 1%, very, a very tiny fraction is invested in addressing resource issues around resource governance. So we're trying to be very... Um, we're trying to be very careful with the way we make these investments so that we can get the most um, leverage or the most impact out of those very small investments. So we, we invest in things such as you know um, piloting projects that will lead to best practices, to lessons, um, that then can be replicated. So I like to tell stories, and you know I've talked about Ethiopia a lot. I think Ethiopia is one of these really interesting cases where the United States invested a very small amount of money with our partners to do something that dramatically changed the, the landscape in the country. So we helped um, 600,000 families gain access or title, if you will. Um, maybe we would call it starter titles. But um, documentation that proved that they had rights to their land. And as a result of those rights, we've done, uh, we've done some analysis, and the World Bank has done some analysis, and Ethiopians have also done some analysis. And we see where household income has gone up dramatically, anywhere between 10 and potentially 40% for some of those households that now have secure property rights. So we also have women telling us things like, you know, I used to um, lease out my land, and now I know that I have a full hectare instead of a half hectare of land, so now I've increased the rental rate. So household income has gone up, and her, um, she's directly benefited from that. So she sends children to school, et cetera, et cetera. So if you multiply things like that, small examples like that, across the country in Ethiopia, or across Africa, using different models that are appropriate for different countries, you can see where you can have a tremendous impact on development and household income, economic growth, food security, et cetera, with just a very small investment in changing or addressing things like property values. Mm -hmm. So just one last thing I'd like to say. Um, the USAID, the US government, is the biggest um, investor in this area, even though it's a very small amount of money. We have projects, some 50 projects in 30 countries, where we're trying to change the, the nature of the landscape <coughs> of property rights in these countries, again, as a gateway to change your or to promote um, economic growth and uh, food security and better natural resource management. Tiernan and Steve, um, I know that your organizations, Comonix and DAI, are, are oftentimes involved in implementing the kinds of projects that USAID is designing. Um, and so I wanted to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about what you see as exciting practical solutions or practical approaches to deal with these problems. I think all of us at, in this panel have had the experience of telling somebody that we work on land tenure issues and being told in response, oh my gosh, it's too complicated, it's too mm. big, it's too political. But I think we also all know that there actually are some interesting practical approaches that you can take. So Tiernan, can I ask you to share yeah. with the audience what you've learned? Sure, sure, I can try. I mean, I think one thing that's important um, and that we've been able to do um, is look at our development projects you know, across the spectrum, all different topics, and identify areas where land is important, where land rights, land ownership is, is a core fundamental issue behind um, some of the problems we're dealing with. So it can be a municipal governance project, um, it can be an environmental conservation project. So one thing we are doing in Ecuador um, is looking at a project we work on called Costas y Bosques, um, is, is trying to help the Ecuadorian government, local communities conserve forests. I mean, it's really a conservation project, that's the goal. It's climate change linked, um, 
But when you look at how do you promote conservation, um, one of the issues is the Ecuador government runs the Payment for Environmental Conservations program, which gives local landowners, local people, um, benefits as a payment for conservation of their land. So rather than cutting down their land or selling it to loggers or et cetera, they protect it and they conserve it and they receive a benefit from the government. But the Ecuadorian government isn't sure who owns the land. Mm -hmm. How do you pay someone if they don't have a title, if they don't have a certificate? So one of the things we've been doing is with local partners um, is utilizing uh, local community paralegals to work with in their communities and other communities to identify who are the landholders, who owns or who uh, uses the, the, the piece of forest that they want to conserve and then give them a certificate. Mm -hmm. It's not a, quite a title, but it shows some type of ownership. And with that certificate, they can then qualify for benefits for their conservation efforts from the government. So that's one example of, of, of work that we've been able to do. So Tiernan, that was a really nice way to point us to the issue of a continuum of rights, that mm -hmm. it's not necessarily the case that people either need to hold individualized um, property titles to have security. They can actually have security, as Steve said, in a number of different ways in providing certificates. Uh, that recognize use rights can be one of those ways. Right. Steve, what are you seeing that looks like a, a good practical approach to dealing with some of these issues? Well, I, you know, I'm going to build a little bit on the on the question of forest rights uh, because I was involved in a study uh, funded by USAID uh, over the last couple of years on the whole experience globally with devolution of forest rights to communities. And Tiernan was offering an example in Ecuador of Sort of, sort of an incomplete assignment or lack of clarity about who, who was in and who was out in terms of having legitimate property rights to a forest. So some colleagues and I looked at the experience of 16 countries uh, worldwide, uh, like five or six in Latin America, five or six in Africa, five in Asia, with their experiences with respect to the devolution of forest rights to communities and what kinds of outcomes have been realized. Now this is sort of the good news in all of this is that USAID and other donors in partnership with a, a number of, of countries they work with have embraced the idea of devolving rights to communities. Uh, you know, once again, if, if we looked at Africa uh, you know, uh, 15 or 20 years ago, 95% uh, of all forests would be in, in the ownership of the state, public ownership. Although people are using it, they're gathering firewood, they're grazing their livestock, they're planting crops, they don't own those forests. Similarly, Latin America, maybe sort of 85 to 90% of forests 15 years ago were owned by the state. So you could have indigenous communities in the upper Amazon region living there for centuries, but not having any kind of authentic ownership over that, over that land. So we looked at the experience, uh, but you know, the, the whole idea of devolution is catching on, a lot of excitement around this. And so well, what, what's actually happened? And we found very interestingly that, and very rapidly, over the last 10 or 12 years in Latin America, there had been a strong movement toward rights devolution. A third of all the land held by states, by the governments, had been devolved to communities, mainly to indigenous communities. And these were authentic rights. I mean, these are real kind of ownership and use rights that enabled those communities to literally take ownership of the management of the resources. They had a basis in rights to, you know, to call people out who didn't, who, who didn't have a right to be there, illegal loggers. So they had an incentive to call the police and say, hey, you know, we've got some illegal loggers in here and they're basically stealing our property, property that we're responsible for managing. And so they started cooperating with law enforcement people in ways that they had no incentive to cooperate with before. So that was really tremendous, the Latin American experience. In Africa, we found though, there have been very, very little authentic rights devolution. There have been new policies, new uh, laws around community ownership, but very, very little authentic devolution. And we sort of found that, well, you know, the forest agencies hadn't yet embraced the idea of forest rights devolution and reorganized themselves in ways that they would need to support communities in managing forests as opposed to policing their use of forests. It's sort of an institutional reorientation problem. This is an area where I think donors could very productively invest. Um, so I think that's really sort of an interesting insight. Now we found in Latin America, and there's some ongoing research, and this is, has to be long-term research, that where communities own resources, management is better, 
That is, there's, there's less cutting of the forest. This is good for climate change goals. And livelihoods improve where communities have property rights to those forests. So two important development goals, conservation, climate change mitigation, that's one, and livelihoods are improving where we devolve forest rights. So that excites me very, very much. So I think, before, yeah, yeah, oh, we on. all want to speak now. <laughs> yeah. before you, Please. Before you go on. We'll go, we'll go down the line. There's actually two and things then I'll come back. I want to respond to that Steve has said. First of all, I think one of the most exciting things that's been happening over the last several years, and I'm, I'll slow down here because I'm a bit excited about this, is really the focus on women's property rights. Right? So in the past, you, you know, we always talked about property rights and it was just assumed that we were talking about men. But in the last several years, we've really been saying, no, you have to focus specifically on women because um, for two reasons. One, we know that when women have access to land and secure rights, there are very different changes, very different financial and economic decisions that are made in the household, which really contribute to better food security for them, their families, and for children. So we know that focusing on women's property rights really gets us a huge bump or an added effect um, in terms of achieving our economic development goals. So that's been a huge development. And in a lot of countries now, we're really focusing on a woman's name has got to be on a title. A woman's name has got to be on the, the deed for the house, et cetera, et cetera. And that's and actually a pretty easy practical it's approach, a really, right? It's a really easy solution. Have the line on the paper. And it's one of those things where we think, well, why weren't we doing that 10 or 20 years ago? The other thing I want to talk about, and this applies to both men and women, and this is something that Steve and I have talked about before, and, it, and it's a case, which I know both you and Carol, both Steve and Carol are familiar with, is Namibia. And the reason why I want to mention Namibia is because we talk a lot in USAID about these kind of what I call corporate arrangements. Mm -hmm. So and I like to think of communities actually as corporations, right? They own, the, everybody in the community, the family, the men and the women, everybody owns a share in the resources and the land and the assets that that community has control over. So when I think about trying to link that corporation up with another outside investor, or maybe it's somebody, it's domestic or it's international, I think about, okay, that's a corporate structure. This is a corporate structure. How do we improve their rights or secure their rights so that these can come together in ways that are profitable for both sides? Yeah. Rather than thinking of, them, uh, thinking of them as individuals and um, you know, without power or without the ability to negotiate or defend their rights. Right, so building the capacity of those corporations, those new sort of corporate models to engage with investors is critical. It's fundamental, and that's something that we're experimenting with at AID. Tiernan? I was just gonna to add to Steve's point that, that this extends to other resources as well, the devolution of, of, res, of resource rights and use rights uh, for forests also applies to, to fisheries, to extractives. We're doing um, some work where we've actually shown this kind of same thing, the conservation of mangroves, conservation of, of sensitive ecosystem, marine ecosystems, is furthered by giving local users, local fishermen, use rights, and that they actually do the patrolling and policing, and they're much more effective at it. Than, than the government, actually, yeah. than the ministry. Yeah. So for, for our viewers who are economists and for those who aren't, really what property rights can do when they're secured is align incentives and create incentives. Yeah. Exactly. And that's actually a critical piece of the property rights puzzle, I think, that they do help create positive incentives and align incentives. Exactly. So thank you, Steve, for pointing that well, out. Just a second, I add a little sort of twist to this, because it comes back to sort of my earlier point about a focus on asset ownership versus a focus on livelihoods in development strategy. A focus on livelihood is, is fundamental. But you know, in the past, so maybe the last, the first sort of 20 years of the focus on community engagement in, in forest management, the focus was on something often that was called benefit sharing. We're, we're the state, we're gonna continue to own the resources, but we're gonna sort of develop sort of small enterprises that you'll be able to participate in and you're gonna get some income from that. That was benefit sharing. But there was no real transfer of ownership rights. Okay? And so what communities found was that, well, you know, the public agency or their agent uh, or their partner had discretion over the terms of the whole arrangement. You know, uh, what they would do, what they would get paid. Would, and so questions of, is this a fair compensation for my labor and for the things I'm giving up by not converting that land to another land use, it didn't work very well. But when people actually own the ownership, like own, own the resource, like in Namibia, they've created under, under law something called conservation conservancies, where in communal areas, the community owns the wildlife. They actually own the live wildlife, which had historically been owned by the state. And so if somebody shot up an antelope for the pot, you know, 
they were poachers and they were vulnerable to fines or to going to prison. Now they own the wildlife. And so they, they have an asset. And if, if you're an investor, if Gregory's an investor, I'd like to have a little sort of safari company going or some better yet a tourism enterprise. I'd like to help build a lodge. Then you negotiate with that community because they own that asset. And so it gives them this tremendous, it comes back to your point, Carol, about it incentivizes their commitment to Maintain, sustainable. forward-looking, Steward conserve, the resources, exactly. exactly. Those ownership rights really create economic empowerment. Yeah, absolutely. They create the power for Legal you to and make economic choices. empowerment. Yeah. And they create the power for you, for individuals and communities to make choices about what they want to do with their lives, what they want to do with their assets. And you can't make those choices if you don't have that power. Yeah, that's exactly right. So it's both legal empowerment as well as economic empowerment that leads to, I think, over the longer term, improvements in governance writ large. So you govern the assets more appropriately, you probably end up getting better governance in the long term. So we've talked a little bit about um, some of the practical approaches, and I'm so glad, Gregory, that you mentioned um, the practical approach of adding a line onto uh, a title document or a certification document to allow for the recognition of women's rights. And I do think this is one of the critical developments of the last decade is the recognition of, of women's property rights. Um, but our discussion is forward-looking. And so because it's forward looking, I'd like to take a few moments and ask you what you see as some of the really exciting opportunities in this sector uh, that are on the horizon. And so Steve, maybe I can start with you. What do you see going on that's exciting? Well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm very excited about this growing realization. It's taken some time to sort of manifest itself that tenure security can be delivered under a variety of forms. Uh, through freehold title in the market, through social relations under customary tenure, and, and, and public ownership. You know, they're vital resources, uh, vulnerable forests, uh, wildlife reserves, areas of, of very sensitive and important biodiversity that are probably best under public stewardship, if, if you will, with increasing focus on how local people benefit from, those, from that sort of property rights arrangement. So I think that what what this diversity of, of tenure arrangements provides is opportunities to think more creatively about the kind of partnerships uh, that Gregory's speaking about. Uh, you know, when we think about investors, foreign investors especially, we think about, well, their partner in the local context has to have um, uh, freehold tenure or a long-term lease right. And that kind of channels the investment toward urban areas, where in developing countries you're more likely to see that kind of arrangement. And then things get very fuzzy when it comes to rural investment uh, in, around, well, who owns the land? Well, and you know, they, they don't get a good explanation. The information is not clear. And, and so where it's clear that communities have statutory ownership of land, then I think possibilities start opening up for new kinds of uh, more, if you will, sophisticated investment in agriculture, in uh, commerce, in tourism, uh, in uh, climate change kind of investments and, and carbon related uh, uh, kinds of investments that can benefit communities, can benefit investors, and can have broad uh, general social economic benefit. So I think that's very exciting. I think a lot of investment is required though in figuring out those investment models and those investment relationships. So I'm very excited about, about that. I think that's a new sort of generation. Once the sort of uh, Statutory recognition takes root. People are confident in their, if you will, their customary ownership rights. Then they're gonna start looking for, for investment opportunities. People are gonna come knocking and they're gonna be inviting of folks in because they can benefit from those investments in ways they would not have been able to before. So they'll be inviting people in on their terms though. Their and terms. right now, oftentimes people are coming, investors are coming in not on the terms of the community. Exactly, the yeah. community is sometimes the last group to know exactly that their land is about to be turned over to some investor uh, that's on a deal brokered by someone in the capital. So Tiernan, I hear uh, Steve talking about the potential for benefits from collaborative contracting or beneficial contracting as well as um, the importance of creating a thicker bundle of property rights. And so as the lawyer on our panel, um, not only will I ask you, what do you see that's exciting moving forward, um, but could you speak a little bit to the opportunity for collaborative contracting that you're seeing 
as one of those potentially interesting future developments? I think there's, there's two areas that I'm excited seeing uh, as we move forward. And some of these are, are seeing if they even develop and how they develop. Um, one is this, the devolution of resource rights that Steve's been talking about, we've all been talking about, and the implications for that of that on good local governance. Um, access to benefits, access to public services. Um, I feel there's a, a key linkage between control, use, ownership at a local level, um, and then how that links into governance structures, municipal, regional, local governance structures. And these are two different tracks. You know, working on land ownership and land rights is one, and then local, improving local governance is another major area, a focus of USAID and other donors. They're linked. And I'm excited to see how these linkages grow as you increase local ownership, devolve resource ownership and governance, how that then also creates incentives and creates the environment for better government, you know, better administration at the municipal level, at the local level, and then how that also goes up to the national level. Um, and second area that I'm really intrigued about and, and, and to see how it goes and where it moves forward is um, this returning of, of land or devolution of land to um, indigenous and customary uh, communities. There, I think there's been, uh, and I alluded to this earlier, there's been an evaluation, a reevaluation of what it means to own land. What, you know, what, what, what type of use translates to actual ownership? And then analyzing that use, that history of use, that pattern of use by communities, and this is indigenous communities in Latin America, which a lot have already been given control ownership too, but it's also customary use in Africa and other places, and then how that can translate to greater local ownership. How by looking at the laws, looking at, 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 at jurisprudence, uh, cases in the courts, how various uh, court systems in different countries are handling uh, cases that are coming through and what that means for um, ownership at a local level. I'm particularly thinking, I mean, one of the, the landmark cases um, which I think has a lot of impact is the Andoroi case in Kenya, where uh, the Andoroi, a customary indigenous community, have uh, the African Commission on, on People and Human Rights told the Kenyan government that the land should be returned to this whole community because their use patterns equates to traditional historical ownership. So I am fascinated to see the implications of that as we move forward and how that can further customary, indigenous, and just local uh, ownership and control over land. Gregory, I know you've been involved in international negotiations, both on the voluntary guidelines and now involved. Now you're involved in the Rye negotiations. Um, the VGs, of course, place a very strong emphasis on recognizing customary rights. As the process of implementing the VGs begins to roll out, what are you seeing as some interesting opportunities or exciting opportunities, especially from your international perspective? I think a couple of things. First, I think what we're seeing here and what's very exciting is a real change in governance. We see governance systems around property, specifically, really evolving and changing. And it's, it's a bumpy process. It's going, to be, it's going to look like this over a period of time. But we're seeing communities, individuals, countries, associations, corporations, et cetera, kind of experimenting around this issue. And I think what we're going to see in 10 or 20 years is, is a new form or new forms of governance which are much more democratic, which vest rights in people and individuals and associations to make decisions about their own assets. So I, th I think that's a really very exciting area. I think it's evolving, and I think it's going to have tremendous um, economic impact. I think as a result, and I think what's driving part of this is all this is the investment. Right? Um, and the outcome of this, this evolution will be new economic opportunities and new investments, new internal investment that will take place. People themselves will be investing, and local companies will be investing, and international companies will be investing. So I, I think what's exciting for me is to see this transformation taking place around governance, around property rights, which I think is very empowering for people. Now, what's happening at the global level is that, you know, Steve and I come from um, um, a similar, we have a similar background at the University of Wisconsin Land Tenure Center. So we've been studying these phenomena all our lives. But for a long time, the global community maybe wasn't really keyed into this, really talking about it. But now you really see this discussed at the global level. So you have United Nations, you know, the FAO, and the Committee for World Food Security, and different UN bodies discussing um, the World Bank and EFOD and bilateral partners and with our 
um, civil society partners and with our implementing partners, this, this very loud discussion now about that we need to really focus on um, these issues. We need to focus on resource governance issues as, again, as a gateway issue to unleashing or um, empowering people to make economic decisions. So this is something that we haven't seen before, this kind of consensus that's kind of growing at a global level that we need to focus on this issue. And so I'm kind of excited about that growing consensus. Yeah, me as well. I think it's a. I think it's been really a tremendous wave building over the last several years. Um, the, the recognition that the issue really is critical to a variety of, of outcomes. And one thing we haven't mentioned, but um, is in the background of our discussion, is the importance of urban tenure issues as well, and how securing rights for urban slum dwellers and other folks living in informal settlements can similarly contribute to economic growth. Um, and help people and, and protect livelihoods, uh, as well as give women op increased economic opportunities. So it's, we, we tend to all be rural specialists, but um, we should recognize the importance of the you're urban looking, sector you're as well. the data from India and China, Absolutely, yeah. how, household plots. These are these household garden plots, and they're contributing significantly to women's income, but also household income. Yeah, that's right, really a critical issue. So we're coming to, um, towards the end of our time. Uh, I wanted to say the thing that I'm excited about in the sector, because the moderator has the floor for a moment, uh, is the fact that there were two different targets in the high-level panel of eminent persons report from earlier this year related to property rights. Um, in the one case, under the gender equality uh, proposed goal, and in the other case, under the uh, eradicating poverty goal. So, Maybe that maybe we'll end up seeing indicators in the post 2015 MDGs related to land, and that would be great because then we could measure progress around securing rights for more people. Um, but for our final question, I wanted to ask each of you uh, to think for a moment and share with us your thoughts on why should people care about this issue, and and if you if you choose, why should Americans particularly care about the issue of property rights in the development sector? We take. We take strong, clear property rights for granted uh, in the U.S. And um, so it's wonderful that we're sort of understanding in our development strategies that this is not the case necessarily in other parts of the world. Uh, in fact, there's tremendous tenure insecurity. I, I mean, this is, this is our enemy, insecurity of, of property rights. Mm -hmm. and, um, and of course, Gregory's and Gregory's office, himself and his colleagues, have been making this argument for many years now that tenure security is really what it's all about, number one. And number two, we can deliver tenure security under a, under a variety of tenure systems. So let's look at what works in developing countries. We often find that customary tenure does work, provides access as a social right, it's equitable, inheritable, secure. And this is very important for poor people who are otherwise very, very vulnerable with respect to their livelihood uh, opportunities. Five years from now, we'll have a better understanding in our country about the importance of tenure security to development in other countries, including to women's rights, to realizing their prospects, to protecting themselves and ensuring the health of their children, uh, but to managing natural resources, to investing in agriculture. So I'm very excited about the foundation that's been set down because I think we were kind of in the dark. We wanted to do so many things with respect to development, investment, uh, women's rights, public health, and we just weren't getting traction. The countries weren't getting, were making progress. And there's lots of explanations for that, but I think an important explanation is insecurity. People didn't have the security of ownership, control of assets that they needed to do, really to take control of their lives. And that's the good news, and I think that realization is really uh, growing worldwide. Yeah, it's a critically important issue. Tiernan, um, let me ask you, uh, why should people care about this issue? And if you're willing, why should Americans care about this issue particularly? Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the classic Martin Luther King quote is, is justice, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Um, and, and your rights, rights to land, rights to use of the land that you have traditionally forever owned, your whole family, is a human right. Um, and so as much as that right is violated, which it is constantly, um, as much as that right is insecure, um, it should be of interest to all of us it is a human right. Um, 
So I, I think that's why we care. I think that's why Americans should care. Um, but Steve is, 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 is completely right. You know, we take it for granted. Property rights are definitely taken for granted. The ability to own your land and sell it and pass it on is, is taken for granted. And it's extremely important that everyone around the world, developing country or, or not, has that right and can realize that, that opportunity. Um, I think more broadly, you can link why should people care about land and land rights to why should Americans care about development more generally? Um, and I think you, know, you could make that argument or you could ask that question. Um, I think we are all, we should all care about economic development, international development, um, because it's the right thing to do, because it's just, but also because, uh, you know, a, a developed world uh, creates more economic opportunity for all. Um, you know, it, it reduces injustice around the world. So that's why we, sh we care about international development. And land, as we've been talking about, is so important to international development. It's, it's the bedrock, it's the foundation for so many issues in international development. Gregory? I think this issue really resonates with Americans. And the reason why is because everybody in America comes from a perspective of we don't mind competition, but we want a level playing field. And so what we're trying to do is to create a level playing field in the countries where, um, where we work. And, and I think everyone um, that I talk to in the United States about this issue, they really understand that, they get this. But beyond that, or in addition to that, by creating secure rights in the countries where we're working, we're also creating more economic conditions, right? Opportunities for investment and for trade. And this directly benefits us. You know, 38 million American jobs are based on trade. Right? One in three manufacturing jobs in this country are based on export. So when we create conditions overseas um, for investment and for trade, this directly benefits Americans here at home. Something that Tiernan is saying as well is that we create a more secure, stable environment. Um, when there are economies that are functioning, people aren't um, in conflict with each other or at war, this creates an environment that we can trade or we can do business. It's not a threat to us. It's a secure place for us to operate. It's a moral issue as well. We, we, we would like to see countries that where we're working have the same kinds of opportunities that we have here in the United States. We're not trying to do anything different. We're not trying to replicate the system that exists in the United States. We're just trying to create conditions in those countries so people have the same kind of opportunities that we have here in this country. So I think this should resonate with Americans. So I'm going to see if I can do a summation for us of the discussion. What I've heard over the course of our time together is number one, Securing rights to property is absolutely critical for people around the world, for women, men, their families, and their communities. Number two, we know based on our experiences that we actually have practical solutions to bring to bear to secure those rights for people in the world. And thirdly, we know that we can provide these solutions in an efficient manner. And if we do that, we have the wonderful opportunity to create a more economically prosperous, but also a more equitable and just society. Does that seem right? Seems spot on. Okay. Excellent summary. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So I would like to thank each of you for, in, for participating in our discussion today. Dr. Gregory Myers from USAID, Tiernan Menon from Comonics, and Dr. Steve Lowry from DAI. Thank you so much for a very interesting discussion. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank DAI for sponsoring this discussion and also thank DevEx for the opportunity to have this discussion. In addition though, um, it, would be, it would behoove us to thank the many development partners we work with around the world and our government and, and host country partners who are working really hard to address this issue. So thanks so much for joining us and hope you enjoyed the program.